As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 227, This Means War. Last time, the Japanese government had sent their reply to the whole note of November 26th to the Japanese ambassador Nomura on December 6th, a Saturday. However, he was told not to hand it over to the Americans until expressly told to do so because the 14-part document was much more than Tokyo's latest response. It was a declaration and a justification of war. And yet, it wasn't. The original final part of the 14th note did mention a declaration of war and an end to diplomatic talks. However, the Japanese military changed the wording just before it was sent out. After all, why give your more powerful enemy any warning of what was to come? Wasn't that militarily prudent? Instead, the last part now read, thus the earnest hope of the Japanese government to adjust Japanese-American relations and to preserve and to promote the peace of the Pacific through cooperation with the American government has finally been lost. Furthermore, the Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government that in view of the attitude of the American government, it cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. This is what FDR had previously interpreted to mean war was coming, and soon, but again, not when there would actually be shots fired in anger. As for the rest of his cabinet, they interpreted this as these current talks were unacceptable to Tokyo. By midday local time on December 6th, Admiral Nugumo, aboard his flagship, the carrier Agagi, ordered a speed of 20 knots. Now that the attack fleet was only hours from launching its warplanes, a point of no return had been crossed. Thus it benefited the attackers to get into position as fast as they could. Just before noon, Nogumo had the same Z flag raised that Admiral Togo had used at the Battle of Tushima Straits on May 27, 1905, when his fleet had sunk two-thirds of the Russian fleet, 21 ships. Seven other ships had been captured. It was called, by one historian, by far the greatest and most important naval event since Trafalgar. And every man aboard the carrier, indeed every man of the task force, knew that flag. Nagumo then sent Admiral Yamamoto's message to him about the upcoming battle to all of the strike force. That the crew was to be firmly determined to fulfill the responsibility entrusted them by the Emperor by destroying the U.S. Pacific Fleet with utmost efforts. The rise and fall of the Empire depends upon this battle. Every man will do his duty. The entire task force was then alive with electricity and possibility. But the question remained, could this first strike achieve total surprise? Back in Washington, Mrs. Dorothy Eggers, relatively new to the naval cryptographic section, though she had lived in Japan for 30 years and could teach Japanese to their high school students, was working that Saturday. She was one of six translators. Seeing the backlog of Hawaii magic messages, she decided to tackle the pile. However, it didn't take her long to see a pattern within the notes between Tokyo and its Honolulu embassy. They mostly spoke of airfield locations, barrage balloons, anti-torpedo nets, and ship movements. Surely this had to be important, so she took her findings to Chief Ship's Clerk H. L. Bryant before she could finish the translations. However, he replied that there was no way he could take what she had done and make them more professional-looking, 
his chief concern, before they both left at noon that day. So Eggers stayed past her punch-out time and translated the messages. That afternoon, the translation branch chief, Captain Alvin Kramer, arrived, and Eggers put before him what she had been able to translate and their significance. Kramer seemed unhappy with this task and her interpretation of their urgency. This was 1941, and Eggers was a female. Still, Kramer got to work, trying to professionalize the notes before sending them on. But before too long, he stopped, and he told her that he had more important things to do. Later, Edgars would see that the changes Kramer was making were trivial, certainly compared to the note's contents. He then told her, This needs a lot of work. Why don't you run along now? We'll finish the editing sometime next week. Still, Eggers persisted, which gained her nothing, so she finished all the translations herself. On Monday, December 8th, the translated notes by her were still on Commander Kramer's desk. That same afternoon, FDR was rethinking the current state of tension between the United States and the Empire of Japan. Clearly, tensions were running high, to the point that a war could break out though it would eventually go badly for Japan. And being a politician, FDR knew the value of seeming to pull back from a game of chicken. It would confuse his adversary and give both sides more time to think of what almost could have happened. More to the point, it gave the United States Army and Navy more time to ready their forces. FDR wrote up his response to the 14-point note, but in a way, so it would appear that he was not responding to a note that, officially, he hadn't received yet. It was addressed to the Emperor, and spoke of avoiding tragic possibilities, if both sides could not come to some understanding. After all, were both the U.S. and Japan about to end their long period of unbroken peace and friendship? He ended with, I address myself to your majesty at this moment in the fervent hope that your majesty may, as I am doing, give thought in this definite emergency to ways of dispelling the dark clouds. But again, the Japanese military was about to insert itself into matters of state. When FDR's note reached the Tokyo Central Telegraphy Office, Major Morimo Tomura of the Army General Staff Communications Section literally shook his sword, though still in its scabbard, to frighten the staff in delaying its being sent to Ambassador Gru. This, of course, would mean it would arrive too late for Gru to present it to Emperor Hirohito. Still, FDR had thought he had made a solid move, one that would buy him and his armed forces more time. While at dinner that night, he told his 32 guests, this son of man has just sent his final message to the son of God. It was after dinner when FDR, along with Harry Hopkins and a naval aide, were given the first 13 parts of the note, recently translated. After reading it, the president said, This means war, and Hopkins agreed. Meanwhile, 4,835 miles, or 7,781 kilometers to the west, the Block Recreation Center at Pearl was hosting the Battle of the Bands. Musicians from the vessel's end dock took turns playing, and one by one they were eliminated. By the end, only the band from the Pennsylvania Super Dreadnought battleship was standing. This earned those boys the right to take on the other finalists, the musicians from the Arizona, the second and last of the Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought battleships, which was scheduled for December 20th. However, the entire musical troupe from the Arizona would be dead before December 7th was done. Still, some of their shipmates would survive the coming attack, but only because they weren't on board the next morning. Drinking through the night at a 
Halekulani Hotel College, the men were passed out drunk when they should have been making their way back to the battleship. As for all the other men whose careers would be destroyed or made by the coming attack, they were scattered about the island as well. Rear Admiral Patrick Bellinger, commander of Patrol Wing 2, he would be the senior naval air commander when the Japanese came the next morning, was laid low, still trying to get over the flu. Admiral Claude Block, for whom the recreation center was named after, had enjoyed a game of golf that day and was in bed by 8.30 p.m. Interestingly, Admiral Husband Kimmel, the man in charge of the U.S. fleet and the Pacific fleet, had been invited to a stag party at the Japanese consulate, though he gave the invitation a miss. One has to wonder what the Japanese at the consulate knew of the coming attack, and what were their designs for Kimmel? Were they simply going to make sure he stayed up all night drinking, or would he have become one of the many casualties of the next day? Instead, Kimmel had dinner at the Halekulani Hotel, but the affair was nothing like the champagne fest being had by the men of the Arizona. Lieutenant General Walter Short and his wife were attending a charity dinner dance at the Schofield Barracks Officers Club. On their way home, they passed by the harbor itself. Reflecting upon the sight of the massive battleships, Short exclaimed, What a target that would make! Lieutenant Colonel George Picknell, the assistant G-2, or division-level, Army Intelligence, had also been invited by the Japanese, but he, like Kimmel, had begged off. That night, Bicknell had been informed by Hawaiian Air Force Signal Officer Lieutenant Colonel Hopaw that Major General Hap Arnold, head of the Army Air Corps, was flying in 13 B-17s. They were on their way to MacArthur in the Philippines, but would stop in Hawaii for refueling. As they were coming in straight from Sacramento, they would be unarmed to save on weight. At 8 p.m. that night, December 6th, Hopal had called Bicknell and asked him to get the local radio station, KGMB, to play music all night long so the B-17s could hone in on the signal. Bicknell exploded and told Hopal that by now, everyone had figured out that when the radio station plays music past its normal time, that aircraft were coming in from the States. So certainly any and all Japanese spies had done so. And, he added, we have been receiving from Washington severe notices that tension was rising with Japan. Bicknell then, still none too gently, suggested that it would be best to play music late every night, hence the Americans would not be tipping their hand. But Hopal stayed unconcerned. He just needed the music to play to get the planes in. He replied to Bicknell, we can talk that over some other time. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History, wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. 
Meanwhile, outside the harbor, beneath the waves, the Japanese sub I-16 was readying to deploy its midget submarine. The idea was for the two-man crew sub to enter Pearl Harbor to guarantee the destruction of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Beyond that, to destroy any U.S. vessels that survived the air attack. I-16's commander Hiroshi Hanabusa released the clamps at 12.42 a.m. on December 7th that held the midget sub and told the two men over the radio that he hoped for their success and return. To which one of the crew replied that if the sub should come back, the Americans might trace it back to I-16, their mothership, and he could not live with the shame of knowing that he got all of his comrades killed. No, this was a one-way trip. Nearby, I-24 readied to release its midget sub. But when it did, the smaller vessel's gyro compass, which ignored previous attempts to repair it, immediately caused the midget sub to steer away from Pearl while traveling in circles. One of the crew broke the rules and prematurely activated his battery-powered electric motor in order to correct course, but it did no good. The vessel circled away from the harbor's entrance. The Japanese carrier-led task force was making its way south, to their launch point. Around nine that night, Captain Mitsuo Fuchida gathered his squadron for a last drink. In truth, he nor any of his bomber pilots could sleep that night, as much as they tried to drink themselves into slumber. The men all assumed they would die on the morrow but that did not bother them. Only failing in their mission was their only concern. Back in Japan's inland sea, the water in between Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu, Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto spent that evening playing shogi, also known as Japanese chess or the game of generals. He wrote a verse and then went to bed. His verse read, It is my sole wish to serve the emperor as his shield. I will not spare my life or honor. And in this, he would be correct. In the early morning of December 7th, in Washington, Ambassador Nomura's office began to receive the 14th and last part of Tokyo's reply to the whole note. And as we have seen, the army had convoluted its wording. The message that went with it from Foreign Minister Togo read, Will the ambassador please submit to the U.S. government, if possible to the Secretary of State, our reply to the U.S. at 1 p.m. on the 7th, your time. This meant that the Japanese consulate in Washington, those persons connected with receiving messages, had to work until 3.30 a.m. to take in the message. This done, the staff was told to come back to work at 9 a.m. later that Sunday morning. However, because Foreign Minister Togo had already made the consulate and others destroy two of their three code machines and no American typists were allowed to help translate the recently arrived message, the staff did not get the document to Nomura until 11 a.m., Right away, the Japanese ambassador began going over the note and requested a 1 p.m. meeting with Secretary of State Hull. The reason? Japan was ready to respond to Hull's note of November 26th. But as Nomura waited, he looked over the document and saw that it had smudge marks and visible corrections. This response was not fit for statesmen, so he would have it retyped. This would force the ambassador to call Hull's office a second time and request a later meeting, around 1.45, to which Hull, who already knew of the note's contents, agreed. The only ones involved who did not realize what the 14th part meant, war, was Nomura and Caruso. Later that morning in Washington, around 10.30 a.m., Secretary of War Stimson and Navy Secretary Knox were on their way to Secretary of Hull's office. 
Today was the day they knew that Japan would respond in word and in deed to the whole note. Again, the burning questions were, where and when? And yet, in the early hours of December 7th, the U.S. intelligence had also received the 14th part and the instructions to deliver the note in its entirety to the Americans. This was decrypted, translated, and given to FDR around 10 a.m. The cabinet, as well as Admiral Stark, Chief of Naval Operation, and Army Chief of Staff General Marshall, would get it soon after. After reading the 14th part, though the wording was indirect thanks to the Japanese military, FDR was more convinced than ever that war was coming. Yes, the British were going to be attacked, maybe as early as today, but perhaps the Japanese were going to renew their attacks in China to finish off General Chiang Kai-shek's government. There was also the Dutch East Indies. Sadly, the 14th part did not say where the attack would take place. But at the very least, Japan was breaking off diplomatic relations with the United States. Japan's next move had to be war. Then Roosevelt met with the Chinese ambassador for a half hour at 12.30. He read to Hu Xin his note of the day before to Emperor Hirohito. He ended the meeting with, This is my last effort for peace. I am afraid it may fail. Secretary of War Stimson and Navy Secretary Knox had spent at least an hour with Secretary of State Hull, trying to outline possible responses to the upcoming meeting with Nomura and Kurusu. Afterward, Knox went back to his office. At 1.30 p.m., Knox received a message from Admiral Husband Kimmel, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. It simply read, Air Raid, Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. At 1.47 p.m., Knox called the Oval Office to relay the shocking news. First, Harry Hopkins took the phone, which was par for the course. FDR, having just finished lunch, was working on his stamp collection. Knox told Hopkins that an attack on Pearl Harbor was underway. Like many in Hawaii at first, Knox and Hopkins believed this report had to be a mistake. Didn't they mean Manila? Hopkins then told the president of the attack. FDR exploded. No! But then he realized that would be just like the Japanese to do something unexpected. The president called Hull and told him of the attack. Hull replied that Nomura and Kurusu were just outside his office, waiting to deliver their note. Though the meeting had been expected to start at 1.45 p.m., by the time the 14-part note was retyped, the men reached the secretary's office at 2.05 p.m. FDR, showing tremendous restraint, advised the secretary of state to not bring up the attack, to see what they would say. FDR went on, greet them formally and coolly, and bow them out. After all, as crazy as the situation was at the moment, the report might be false. Holt brought the two men in at 2.20 p.m. Though he knew all the particulars of Japan's response, having read it a few hours ago, he pretended to read the papers handed to him. Nomura and Kurusu sat there waiting. Again, they did not know that the attack on Pearl Harbor had already started. FDR can be credited for staying relatively calm after his first outburst, but that was not the stuff of what Hull was made. As he skimmed the documents, his eyes fell on certain phrases that made his hands tremble with rage. That the U.S. has resorted to every possible measure to assist the Chongqing regime so as to obstruct the establishment of a general peace between Japan and China. That American demands for Japan's wholesale evacuation of troops 
which ignored the actual conditions of China and area calculated to destroy Japan's position as a stabilizing factor of East Asia. To wit, as the 14th part stated, that the Japanese government cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement throughout further negotiations. Hull's charade of reading the note done, he looked up at the two men, who were confused by the sudden tension in the air, and he declared, In all my fifty years of public service, I've never seen a document that was more crowded with infamous falsehoods and distortions. Infamous falsehoods and distortions on a scale so huge that I never imagined until today that any government on this planet was capable of uttering them. Still in shock, the two Japanese representatives, still completely clueless, stood, bowed, and walked out. When they exited the building, reporters howled questions at them, which made no sense to the two men. They quickly climbed into their car. Back at their embassy, when the gates closed behind them, American police reformed a ring around the consulate, because numerous American civilians were yelling at those inside, trying to force their way in. The vitriolic anger was easy to perceive. When Nomura and Caruso exited their car, it was only then they were told that their countrymen had already attacked the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor one hour earlier. <laughs> 